Hi everyone, and happy Halloween. Today I'm going to be talking about the Addams Family 2019 animated reboot, and oh boy, it's pretty mediocre. But the first half of the video is more so me just talking about the history of the Addams Family, the casting, the budgeting, the animation, etc. So if you don't want to hear about all of that and just want to hear me talk about the movie itself, go here and you'll all be good. Happy Halloween everybody, and I hope you enjoyed the video a little bit more than I enjoyed the film. Does it, does it look like me? Cooper doesn't think so. Hey everyone, Anthony Fantano here, the internet's busiest bad Halloween film reviewer on the Knockout Wolf channel. It's me. It's I'm I'm doing I'm doing Fantano again for Halloween. And we're talking about the Adams Family film. It's not good. Sorry, I know I shouldn't have to explain who I am, but it might be a little bit hard for people to realize that with the mask and, and the goggles, you know, it's the, the pandemic get up. You don't want any any COVID going in the, the mouth, the, the eyes. Um, but obviously, once I take the mask off, it's, it's uncanny, right? It's uncanny. We look pretty similar. I lost the glasses. That's right. If you wear a red flannel at Halloween, you too can have the best teeth in the game. You may remember last Halloween we looked at the film Holidays, and let me tell you, it's not good. Anyway, this year we're going to be talking about this year we're going to be talking about the 2019 Adams Family animated reboot. But Fantano doesn't review movies; he reviews music. So let me just look around. For... Ah, this album is a strong 14 years old. It's it's 14 years old today. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Who knew that a film trilogy starring Adam Sandler and his friends as vampires, ghosts, and ghouls would be so much better than an animated Adam's Family movie? It's not me. It's not me. Over the last 20 so years, the Adam's Family franchise had presumably and appropriately been laid to rest. Get it? Because they're, they're, not, they're not dead. They're just kind of mysterious based on the cartoon panels made by charles adams yes that's his real name that debuted back in 1938 in the new yorker the adams family featured a mysterious and spooky family whose altogether ooky lifestyle would be adapted <laughs> which would be adapted more than half a dozen times both on the small screen and the big screen across 35 years happy halloween happy halloween trust me cal you're probably going to want to skip on this one unless you're the, the seven-year-old child and... that's okay anthony a lot of my homies are kids is that weird you know i may be reviewing the movie today though but it has got a pretty catchy theme song <laughs> Ooh, hold on there buddy hold on we just gotta okay we're good but don't come any closer. However, sadly, all this changed in 2019 during an era of unnecessary remakes and despicable me beedle, 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 weirdly proportioned body looking ass animation that costs like two bucks f to, to animate. I don't know. The fuck? The fuck? During this era, the Adams Family finally woke up from their 21 year slumber just for this poorly written boring waste of potential that effectively tries to use a great cast to save this disappointment of a movie the same way that someone might try and roll a turd in glitter. It's not good. But before I burst a blood vessel talking about this, how about I give you a brief recap of the Adams Family TV and film timeline thus far. Oh my god, I need to lie down. In my opinion, the best TV portrayal of the Adams Family was back in 1964. David Levy nailed the TV debut for the comedy horror sitcom. And as someone who sadly caught themselves actually laughing at a Family Guy gag at 2am this morning, I never actually imagined myself genuinely enjoying a 1960s black and white sitcom for laugh track. Yet this show does such a great job at establishing these characters as the family that we got to know over the following decades. They even got the lion! Not even the movie got the lion. I think Lurch is especially great in this show, putting the later live action TV adaptations to shame. And in this you can genuinely believe that Gomez and Morticia are truly in love. Perhaps not as head over heels as in the Barry Sonfeld 90s movies, but we'll get to that. The show ran for two seasons from 1964 till 1966. However, they did return with a Halloween special in 1977. But before that, in 1973, during the prime of Go away, Jeff. I said I just said Prime. I didn't say Amazon. I just said Prime. During the <coughs> Prime of Hanna Barbera Scooby-Doo movies, the Adams Family appeared for a special called Wednesday Is Missing, 
which featured the family animated similarly to the comics. See MGM, this is how you make them look like the comics without giving Wednesday a forehead the size of the landing strip for a Fast and Furious 6. After that, Hanna-Barbera ran a 16 episode animated series with a similar style to the Scooby-Doo version, but with a really cursed sounding Gomez. Ooh, can you forgive me, Karita? It kinda sounds like somebody pecked his nose. I mean, I mean, left a peg on it. You, you know what I, you know what I mean. Speaking of voices, Pugsley was voiced by an 11-year-old Jodie Foster in this. That, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. After the TV show reunion in 1977, the Adams family lay dormant for 14 years until they were given the true Hollywood treatment, baby, in 1991 and 1993. Barry Sonfeld's The Addams Family and Addams Family Values are truly the peak of The Addams Family, perfectly blending comedy, horror, and loose but enjoyable plots featuring a stellar cast, and in my opinion, this is where they should have stopped trying. That's it. You, that was it. It was the best. You could, you could stop trying. They got it. They did it. And as I mentioned earlier, I think these movies perfectly capture how madly in love Gomez and Morticia really are without sacrificing the naturally sly and dominant character that Morticia is. And I honestly find it hard to imagine anyone else being able to play these roles as well as the late role Julia, who unfortunately passed away a couple years after the release of Values, and of course Angelica Houston, who you may have recently seen in John Wick 3. Isn't that kind of cool? Carol Stryken as Lurch, who recently also gave a great performance in the fantastic Doctor Sleep. And I'm telling you, if you haven't seen Doctor Sleep yet, stop, stop sleeping on it. Oh, jeez. We've got Back to the Future legend Christopher Lloyd as Uncle Fester. And of course me. That's cousin it. I don't know why everybody says that. I don't think it's really worth talking about the rest of the 90s for the Addams Family. I mean, there was a decent new animated series from 1992 to 1993, but truly the final nail in the coffin was the year 1998. The Addams Family Reunion. A straight-to-home video movie, that should say it all, that both Angelica Houston and Christopher Lloyd apparently turned down, replacing the late role Julia with Tim Curry, and oh boy, not even a fantastic Tim Curry could save that train wreck. Aptly, a TV series called The New Addams Family came out later the same year that was cancelled after just one season. Listen, I'm, I'm gonna be real with you. There's episodes up on YouTube, just watch five minutes. In fact, just watch two minutes and you'll probably see why. Honestly, my first thoughts was that I was watching a college humor parody of The Addams Family. He's here! Mama! Morticia! I'm so excited! The only redeeming factor is that John Astin, the original Gomez from the 1964 series, makes a return as Grandpapa Adams. I'm back! And finally, here we are in the hellish landscape that is 2020. <laughs> A year after MGM brought back the spooky family in the form of a $24 million animated reboot that looks like it was animated by a kid looking over Illumination Animation's shoulder in class and then tried animating it, copying it. It doesn't look great. It does not look great. It somehow manages to look cheaper and less detailed than Illumination Studios. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let my hair down now because I feel like at least Anthony Fantano would uh, would realize that $24 million isn't uh, much for an animated film, unlike I did before I did the research for this video. But when you find out that incredible films like The Invisible Man were made for just $7 million and three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri were made for $15 million, you may think, wow, $24 million is quite a large budget. But no, it's not. It's actually quite a small budget for an animated movie. And let's just evaluate the all-star cast that voiced this movie. We got Oscar Isaac of Star Wars fame, actress and producer Charlize Theron, Chloe Grace Moretz who kicks ass in, in, in kick ass. She's like a kid and she kicks ass. Speaking of teenage actors, how about rising star Finn Wolfhard of Stranger Things and that Weezer music video and the much, much better pup music video. He was just a little kid. Nick Kroll, oh God, it's the guy from Big Mouth. La 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 la, it's the mother friggin' D-O-double-G. Snoop Dogg. Bette Midler from Hocus Pocus. Allison Janney of The West Wing. Catherine O'Hara of Come On! And Beetlejuice fame, who also voiced Sally in The Nightmare Before Christmas. Thanks to my girlfriend for telling me that the other day. Who was only in the movie for like 90 seconds as Morticia's late mother. As well as comedian Martin Short playing her late father. And so many more. There's so many big actors in this movie. You may be kind of confused on why I'm bringing up the cast and what else they've starred in before doing this movie. But what I'm getting at is that surely having such an all-star cast like that burnt away quite a lot of the budget, which begs the question, how much of their $24 million budget was left to actually animate the movie? I'll hold my hands up and say, I have no idea how much actors get paid in Hollywood. And it's kind of hard to estimate a number when you got Oscar Isaac, who's the main voice 
in this movie who got paid two million dollars to be kind of a main character but like one of the side main characters in the the new star wars trilogy and he made two million dollars from the force awakens so obviously he was there acting in person not just voice acting and i think disney has a bit more money in the budget to pay people so it's really hard to guess but let's say the cast ate up 10 million dollars you got to remember how many big actors are actually in that including snoop dogg they, they also use the snoop dogg song which i think they'd have to pay quite a lot for the license for even if he was in the film i feel like that's kind of out of his hands but if paying that cast a voice actor did cost 10 million they've got about 14 million dollars left to actually animate the whole movie but still that's double the budget of the invisible man which i thought was a fantastic movie probably one of my favorites i've seen this year granted i haven't had the chance because you know but I don't know things. I don't know how much it costs to animate a movie alongside just shooting one in real life. Um, so let's get some perspective and look at other animated films that were also released in 2019. Spies in Disguise by Blue Sky Studios and 20th Century Fox cost $100 million to make and made $171 million in the box office. Abominable by DreamWorks. Yo, remember Shrek? Well, they, they made it. And he also made this. It cost him $75 million and made $189 million back. Wonder Park, a movie I didn't know existed by Paramount Animation and Nickelodeon, which cost apparently between $80 to $100 million and just made $119 million. However, 2012's Hotel Transylvania, probably the closest thing we've had to an Adams Family movie since the 90s, was made for $85 million. That's well over three times the amount the Addams Family movie cost, and it was made seven years beforehand as well. And it made a whopping $358 million at the box office. Who knew Adam Sandler and his friends could still make that happen? And honestly, they made three of these movies, and they're all pretty good. Albeit a pretty quiet year for animation, looking back on those films from 2019 and how much they made at the box office against their budget, the low-budget Adams Family reboot made $203 million. That's right, it was made for much, much less than, and made more, than films by 20th Century Fox, DreamWorks, and Nickelodeon. Oh my god. And although it was an established series already against these new franchises that were coming out, not only did it make more money at the box office, but because the budget was so small, the profit they made was huge. A hundred and eighty million dollar profit from what a lot of people would consider a pretty bad film. So of course you know what that means. Sequel? Honestly, as poor as that show has gotten over the last 15 years, I'd much prefer a Simpsons movie sequel at this point. I mean, hey, at least they can raise the budget? Uh, hopefully? Please do. Please do. Okay. I think I've rambled about The Addams Family enough, so let's actually go through the film and see what all the fuss is about. The film starts about 15 years before the events of the movie at Gomez and Morticia's wedding. The entire Addams Family is present for the wedding, which is pretty cool seeing all these weird and wonderful people. However, the villagers are like, what are you, a goth or something? And run them out of town with pitchforks and torches at the ready. Gomez says we'll go somewhere no one in their right mind would get caught dead in. And then they're seen driving to New Jersey, which is honestly pretty funny, uh, but that's pretty much where the laughs end in this film. I feel like he kind of did lurch dirty here because they come across him in this jumpsuit saying he's criminally insane, and then they're like, here are our bags, just be our slave. And I guess he just conforms. And they arrive at his house that they describe as creepy, kooky, mysterious, spooky. I like that. Which I think was meant to be the insane asylum that Lurch came from, but it's very similar to the Adams Family house that we've seen for decades, and it looks great. Lurch takes his place at the piano as he would in the original TV show, and then Thing, the little hand, comes over, and they do this scene which I think is meant to be funny, but it's, it's really not, and I don't know if that's just because I'm not a child, like this film was made for children, and I'm like, this isn't funny! So I'll just take the loss on that one, but it was nice that they concluded with the original theme song. I am going to be talking some smack about this film, but honestly, I thought the vibes were kind of right with this opening credit scene. It was a great way to show the time jump from them moving in to them having the kids and them growing older and being a family together. Morticia catches Thing looking at feet pics on a laptop, which I honestly thought was pretty funny. It's a nice little sprinkle of some slightly more mature humor for the older people watching it and the adults with their kids. But just like the New Jersey sign, it's kind of a rare highlight, unfortunately. Oh my god, what is this character design? Holy shit! Everyone in this film is either chubby and round or stick thin and in danger of snapping at any moment. 
Wednesdays have been tied into nooses is a nice touch though. The film introduces the family up to their regular antics, and it introduces Pugsley in this really over the top rocket scene, but it's kind of just an example of how animating a film like this gives them an opportunity to replace developing a sinister child character with good scripting and believable yet ridiculous antics, and instead just uses this over the top sequence where Pugsley rides a rocket around the Adams Family residence with all these whoa big explosions did you see that kids and I'm aware this is a kids film but with some of the other edgy and more mature elements they added to the film like they would in other Adams Family movies they definitely weren't just aiming for a demographic of kids that will giggle along to Pugsley blowing up 200 foot in the sky and then coming out unscathed ah uh, they blow up so fast these days <laughs> Okay, so I like Finn Wolfhard, but he really does not fit this role whatsoever. All right, Pop. I'll practice. That's my boy. Is it, though? It's a scene where Gomez is explaining to Pugsley that he's got to prepare for his mazurka, which is like a family tradition, a coming-of-age event, if you will. And yeah, it adds to the plot, but it just had Pugsley flying 200 foot in the air on a giant rocket and then exploding and then come back down to Earth and just stand there sort of motionless and just talk for like a while it's kind of weird so uncle festa comes over to try and help gomez prepare pugsley for his mazurka and i like that they've tried to replicate some of the character relationships and they did it well with festa and gomez i'll give him that but let's not get ahead of ourselves praising this movie because oh my god prepare yourself we now get introduced to the movie's antagonist margot needler Oh my god, this character is so fucking annoying. So she's this presenter on this home makeover type show. And okay, they did a good job of bringing the whole over-the-top home renovation TV personality to life. But despite being the antagonist of this movie, I feel like she's also meant to be funny. You know, she's meant to be this comedic relief other than the Addams Family. And instead, she is just annoying as hell. And her voice is so grating. And I'm about to stage a design intervention! Although her hair being a parody of these over-the-top huge perms that TV personalities often have is funny for about two seconds, and then I want to throw it every time I see her on screen! Why do animated films look like this now? What happened? And look at this character! Why is this torso a triangle? Why is this chin so long? Oh my god, this is hard to watch. This is painful to watch. So Margot Needler's home renovation show needs this big finale where she makes this town this perfect, beautiful place to live in. And the idea is to create this big contrast between the dark and desaturated Adam's house and the bright, colourful town. But honestly, every scene that happens in the town feels so boring. You could argue that it's ironically bland because they tried to make this town perfect and in actual fact it ends up being boring because of that. <laughs> but I don't think it was intentional because they do make jokes like that later on in the film being like, hey, we're all so happy and perfect being exactly the same, poking fun at the fact that they're probably not all happy being exactly the same. But I just think the town looks bland and boring because they didn't really have the budget to animate it nicely at all. I made a whole song and dance earlier about how I think the animation is kind of bland and boring for the most part, but there are some good shots like when the balloon rotates around the house. I also kind of like the it reference, not gonna lie. Strange. There's usually a murderous clown attached to the other end of these. But then on the other hand, you're reminded of that illumination animation inspiration that's kind of- Oh, that was kind of cool. But just look at these four characters, for example. There is so little consistency in the design of the characters in this film. And not in a, haha, look at these funny characters type way, but more in a way that feels like one of those animation collaborations, like that episode of Bob's Burgers, where a different animator will take each scene and animate it in their style. Except it's a different person designing each character. And and the whole world just feels horrible. So Margot is filming her show and notices that the Adams family mansion is an eyesore. So of course, she's got to get rid of it. Yeah, the storyline of this film is so predictable it hurts. Oh, come on, the film can't be that predictable. If it really was, the next scene would be, I don't know, the Adams family like going into the town and then everybody being scared of them because they're so different to them. Come on, Dish, let's explore the neighborhood. <sighs> So after scaring some of the locals, the Adams family come across this song being performed by some school kids. Ah yes, let's make all the popular girls stick thin. What a great idea for a kids movie. I do like this tongue-in-cheek forced happiness thing they're singing about with the It's easy to be happy when you have no choice. It fits well into the perfect happy town sort of vibe Margot's going for. Uncle Fester tries to get involved and sings a funny song. I dip my head to you! I do get that! Bum, 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 bum. 
This is actually quite a nice scene. Oh my god, Fester, no Fester's John! Uncle Fester might be the only decently consistent comedic relief in this film, although remembering it's Nick Kroll who made Big Mouth makes me a little bit sad. Margot meets the Adams family and offers them a free makeover in an attempt to save her TV finale where she makes over the entire town. But of course, the Adams family's horrible house would ruin it, so she has to destroy it. I started to feel like from this midpoint of the film that Finn Wolfhard had scheduling issues or something, because he hardly speaks in some of these scenes despite his training for the Mazurka being an integral part of the film. Instead, for quite a while, they just show him being strange, which is cool because it fits into the vibe of his character, but he just doesn't say anything. So Gomez and Morticia are giving Margot and her crew a tour of the mansion, and this kind of bridge of spiders forms, and they walk across it, and Morticia says, We call this surfing the web. Hi fellow kids, it's 2019. Have you heard of the internet? Turns out the barrels of wine in the cellar are actually barrels of whiny voices, which is a very cheap pun, but I kind of liked it, unfortunately. Are we there yet? What do you mean? Of course, in a movie like this, there has to be a character with a smartphone. I think part of the magic of the Adams Family in the past is that you don't really know what time zone it's set in, but in this, they're just like, yep, it's 2019. She's vlogging. How relatable is this? I'm almost surprised that she doesn't do a TikTok in it, honestly. So this girl who's vlogging is actually Margot's daughter, and she's called Parker. Parker meets Wednesday and starts telling her about her life and her school, and this starts the subplot of Wednesday wanting to reject the mysterious and spooky Adams Family genes with in her. So Margot starts spray painting the house in random ways and oh it's so funny because they, they think the makeover is over. Get it? Because they only like horrible things apparently. They do this a few times in a film where like Lurch is actually putting dust on things instead of vacuuming and they break a window and they're like yo that's perfect. And it makes me think that the people who made this film just thought that the Adams family liked living in a shithole rather than just living in this sort of dark and spooky mansion. I really think they got the wrong end of the stick there. Gomez mentions to Margot the idea of their whole family moving to the town, and so she starts plotting to run them out of the town, repeating history just like at their wedding. Wednesday goes to school and oh no! What a surprise! The popular skinny girl is a huge dick. Even more predictably, the girl's being horrible to Parker, and so Wednesday squares up. And she's actually betrayed quite well in this scene. Chloe Grace Moretz does a great job of voicing her monotone yet sinister voice. The popular girl calls Wednesday, Little Gua. Which we found funny, because that's something my girlfriend would actually consider a compliment. We then find out that Margot Needler is trying to turn the neighborhood against the Adams by spreading lies about them. Oh no! Who could have seen that one coming? Your daughter has a mustache! What the hell is wrong with your ovaries? This character honestly feels like a cheap version of Debbie from Adam's Family Values. You know, the woman who marries Uncle Fester to try and kill him and steal the family fortune. Except she was actually a likable antagonist. She was horrible, and you loved it. So Wednesday and Parker attend science class where they're tasked to dissect a frog. And as an English person, I've really got to ask all my American viewers, does this even happen that often in science class in America? Because like every film and TV show set in a school in America has to dissect a frog apparently. Then yes, I drink tea with the queen. That's a stupid question, man. And the next thing you know, Wednesday's using this huge bolts of electricity to try and resurrect a frog, similar to the way Frankenstein's monster was created. And yeah, this evil scientist thing, although on brand, is just another one of those sections like Pugsley on a Rocket that's like, haha, yes, over the top animated thing. Look, look what we can do with animation. It may sound stupid me criticizing scenes not being animated animated enough, and then some scenes being animated too much, but it's almost as if it's either one or the other. Like, don't get me wrong, I could imagine them doing something similar to this in one of the live action films, but with her just sort of going over the top with the mad scientist role, instead of getting out this huge massive mechanism, like, where did, where did that come from? You know, a bit like the scene in the movie where she causes all the chaos during a Thanksgiving play at summer camp, and that scene remains fantastic. There's a weird transition of Lurch playing piano with Thing, it's kind of like, hey, do you remember that Lurch plays piano? Piano, but to be honest, it's kind of a jam. So Grandma Adams turns up and honestly, her design in this film is great. They hit the nail on the head with her. Wednesday comes home from school with a pink hair clip in and acts like an angsty teen discovering themselves, whereas they just made it in the form of Wednesday discovering color. Although it's silly, I suppose this is a unique character development that we haven't seen in the previous movies, but it feels more like, ew, being spooky and goth is weird, kids. Why are they depriving her of being a girly girl? And I don't know, that just kind of sat weird with me in an Adams Family film. The film does a great job of reminding you, Hey kids, it's 2019. Have you tried filters? 
So as Wednesday wants to try and upset Morticia with her newfound girliness, Parker wants to piss off her mum, and oh boy, this part was such a highlight of the film for me. So Wednesday comes home dressed in pink like Parker would be, and Morticia is <laughs> Which kind of pissed me off, because I really don't think that's in Morticia's character at all. But Morticia in this movie is just kind of a dick for the most part. I do not like it. Everyone knows pink is a gateway colour. I kind of thought the line pink is a gateway colour was kind of funny though. Finally, after like 20 minutes of Pugsley being absent from the film, they remember that he's meant to be training. After all, that is the reason that Festa's there in the first place. And whoa, what, what? No, he still can't do it? He, what? I'm, I'm shocked. I'm, I'm really shocked by this development. Okay, here we go. This is it. This is the best scene of the entire film. Emo Supremo. Hey guys, this is me now. If you like it, hit like. But who cares if you like it? I'm living my truth. Honestly, same. I love this so much. This is the best part of the entire film. So Margot gets pissed off at Parker being Emo Supremo and takes her phone away from her? No! Please, no! Anything but that! What is she gonna do? Didn't you know that kids die? If they don't use social media for two minutes? Wednesday runs away because she's sick of being expected to be just like her parents. And although I think it's very important to be yourself, I just don't think that Gomez and Morticia would want her to be like that if she wasn't happy being like that. For example, in Adam's Family Values, when they have the baby and it's not quote-unquote normal. So they try and raise it like a normal baby, you know? But no, she comes home wearing a pink hair clip, and that's not allowed. I hate this next bit so much. In fact, my girlfriend just looked at me in pure disgust in this scene, as they had Lurch singing Everybody Hurts. When the day is long. I feel like the deep voice monster having a voice of an angel joke lasted for a solid two seconds before getting old. But it's a kid's movie, why do I care so much? Here we go, baby. It's Snoop Dogg time. I really do wonder how much of the budget went towards him being in this. So Cousin It turns up in a Cadillac with Cuz written on the number plate, which I loved, by the way. They've kind of banjo kazooie Snoop Dogg's voice to be Cousin It, and I also love the fact that most of the kids watching this will have no idea who he is either. Wednesday stays at Parker's house and they find her mum's secret lair under the house, where she has cameras in everybody's house, which is pretty fucking weird, not gonna lie. Oh my god, she then finds them in a room and locks them in the attic! Because I guess two emos were gonna turn a full town against her when she's liked by the whole town. Okay! So members of the Adams family turn up for the mazurka, and Triangle Man panics that they're going to ruin the finale of Margot's show. So Margot sends out a warning to all the residents of the town, and their phones turn into torches. Which, as much as we both let out a big sigh, I think we did kind of find it funny. So the Adams extended family turns up at the house, and one who can set his head on fire says, This party's gonna be lit! <laughs> How many times are we gonna have to bring out Steve Buscemi? How many times? This scene with all the Adams Family characters in the house together is so fun, because you get to see all the creativity the animators had when making a room full of fun and spooky family ma- Oh, you're not telling me they did a better job of this in the 1991 live action movie. Oh, you are. Oh, good. Pugsley then has to perform his mazurka. And honestly, there's some fun choreography in this scene, if you can call it choreography when it's animated. It's no mamushka, but it'll do. Mamushka! And what's quite nice is that Pugsley doesn't actually pull it off. With how predictable this film has been so far, I was expecting him to just pull it off somehow on the day, even though he's been struggling to do it all this time leading up to it. I suppose the second most predictable thing that would happen instead would be if he proved his worth to his family in his own way. But I really can't imagine a situation in which that would happen. Okay, it's happening right now, isn't it? The Mazurka music was fun, but now they got some cringy ass lyrics like, it's about protecting my family. You know, the same family that they hadn't seen for 13 years and started shaming Pugsley for not being able to do this weird ass sword ritual? I'm not going New Zealand. Margot Needler starts destroying the Adams family house whilst they're all still in it, may I add, with this huge catapult. Who? What? Where the shit did you get this from? This scene is quite chaotic and fun, and although it is another example of animation being able to do over the top things that they couldn't do in a live action film, I feel like this is good reason to do it. As well as having their pet lion, my girlfriend really appreciated the fact they actually had Aristotle the Octopus in it, so they got some details right. Oh no! Is the Adams Family kill? Yo, it's Wednesday. And a tree from Harry Potter, cool. So the residents of the town, you know, the ones who literally just mobbed together to try and basically kill them, have now realised that they're just a family like they all are. They're also massive freaks because she puts her underwear in the freezer. 
Ew, what a freak. It's refreshing, okay? Parker exposes Margot for spying on the town. You've been live this whole time. Three million people are watching you right now. Oh my god, how the hell did Emo Supremo get three million viewers to watch her live stream exposing her own mother? I guess if Margot was world famous, then maybe three million people would tune in to see her almost kill an entire family. Eh, yeah, I'd probably tune in if it was Gordon Ramsay. You don't care. I care, You're chef. way behind and you haven't got a fucking clue. Somehow the network can't cancels her show within seconds of this happening, and she realizes she'll go bankrupt now because she has an entire town of houses to sell. And not really sure why, because I thought they were already all lived in. Like, I thought she was just renovating houses that people already lived in. I take your uninspired living space and turn it into the perfect palace of your dreams. And then I guess Uncle Fester suddenly realizes he's in love with her. You know, the lady who literally just tried to kill him and his entire family. They join forces and sell all the houses to members of the extended Adams family who wanted to move to the town. So even the antagonist has a happy ending, apparently. Great. The residents of the town help rebuild the Adams family house, and they all live together in harmony, including this asshole who apparently is now just a decent person. Oh, please say she's not in the sequel. That's right. There's unfortunately a sequel coming next year. A sequel. How original. But honestly, let's hope it's a bit better, because although this film is kind of hard to watch, they're reviving this great franchise, and the cast are pretty decent too. It just had some questionable animation, pretty poor writing, and it, it kind of sucked. It wasn't great. I feel like maybe I did give this film too much flack, but honestly, me and my girlfriend sat down to watch it the first time. By the way, she's a huge fan of the Adams Family. She adores the series from the 60s, she loves the films, we were kind of skeptical about this, so we didn't go and see it in theaters. And then it came out and we watched it on Netflix. And after the first 15 minutes, I think, we turned it off. And it took us like six weeks later to actually give it a go again. But they actually rounded off this mediocre movie pretty nicely with an animated recreation of the original intro from the 60s show. And my girlfriend loved that. And I really think it paid homage to the- Okay, spoke too soon because it ends with this horrible rap. We different. We stick out. Stick out. We go. We go. Bug out. Hey. This isn't the Adam's family rap. But that's about it. Thank you very much, everybody, for watching. Happy Halloween once again. I know everyone's saying, oh, Halloween's canceled. Oh, no. no, you go and watch those original two Adam's Family movies from the 90s and you enjoy it. Thank you very much, everybody, for watching. My name's been Brody, otherwise known as Knockout Wolf. I'd appreciate it very much if you hit the like button on my video, not the Adam's Family movie. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. I also stream three times a week on twitch.tv. Links in the description. We've been playing some spooky games recently and I, I didn't I didn't shit my pants. <laughs> Who said that? Fuck off. Oh, 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 oh.